Hello and welcome back to our concluding session on a series, about a 12 or 13 part series on beliefs of Jesus, some of the beliefs of Jesus. And if you've been following us, the basic thesis I tell you each week about is that we believe things about Jesus and then some people after learning about Jesus decide to believe in Jesus. And then there seems to be this sort of gap between believing in Jesus and believing like Jesus. In fact, many of us have never really thought, well, what did Jesus believe? We're, we're taught to believe in him, but we're not taught to believe like him. And so this series has been really kind of putting our toe in the ocean of what did Jesus actually believe? And this is our concluding um, talk on this, on this subject for right now, at least. And uh, I want to start by just saying a personal example or giving a personal example. Uh, I, I'm a person who loves to look at maps. And I mean real maps made out of paper, you know, that you look at and you can see where Highway 80 goes and how, where Idaho is exactly and Montana. And I, I just love that. I love looking at topographical maps or topos as we used to call them when I, I ran a, a wilderness guide program in my early 20s, and uh, it would guide people through wilderness areas using just a topographical map where you can see the little rings, and you can get to where you can look at the map and actually tell, oh, that, that's a cliff over there, and here's this 14,000-foot peak, just by looking at the way the rings go. And I just love, love looking at maps. But what I love even more than looking, let's say, at a topographical map of the Continental Divide in a certain section, what I love even more than looking at that map is hiking in the country that the map is all about. And that's what we want to do from this series. We, we don't just want to look at the outlines of what Jesus believed and think about them and say, isn't that interesting? Isn't that good? Gee, wasn't that a great teaching? We, we want to walk in those teachings. We want to live into those teachings. It's like somebody who's looked at great paintings and great photographs of the Grand Canyon at sunset. And maybe they've got them all over their wall because they just love it. But they've never been to Arizona. They've never looked over the rim of that incredible canyon and felt the, the, the sense of awe welling up inside of them. <laughs> Even the sense of vertigo as they look down into that tremendous cavern. It, it's not a photograph. It's a reality. These are not just ideas about Jesus or about what Jesus believed, but he was describing a reality that he was walking in and living in. It's kind of like a dating app. You know, you get a buy, I've never done one, just let me be clear here. Uh, uh, 50 years of marriage, I'm happy. But I hear that you get a dating app and you look at a bio, you see a picture and then you find out the person's interested in this and interested in that. And let's just assume these are actually accurate bios, uh, which I understand they aren't always, but they're, you're looking and, you, and maybe you even correspond a little bit with the person. But that's way different than actually meeting the person liking the person, falling in love with the person, and deciding to share your whole life, your family, your struggles, your joys, and your sorrows with that person. You see, it's, it's not a bio about Jesus. It's actually an encounter with Jesus is what I'm encouraging you to. Now, now we've gone over, uh, I think it's 19 different uh, beliefs of Jesus. And I want to tell you one thing for sure. It, it's not a set of rules. This is not a new set of rules for you to follow. If, if you've kind of gotten that out of the series, I've failed you. It, it's coming to know the reality from which these beliefs arise. And that reality is God. That reality is the Abba, the Father of Jesus. Uh, the all-loving, all-tender Father who says, You are my beloved daughter, and I'm so pleased in you. Yeah, you are my beloved son, and... I just love who you are. That, that, that's the immersion that I want us to have. It, it, so it's not a bunch of rules. It's not even 
beliefs about what Jesus thought, and it's certainly not a system of thought where it all lines up perfectly, and it's certainly not about perfecting your individual morality. You know, if, 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 if that's what it's about, then it's just a code. Uh, then it's just a religious structure. Then it's just, as I talked about last week, it's an outside-in job. Here are the rules. You should keep them. Jesus said, love your enemies. You better love your enemies. That's not it. It's a change of the heart. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, Jesus said this truth will become a spring of living water within you, welling up into God's kind of life, which is eternal life. So it's, it's not those things. It's not a rule. It's not just believing about things. It's not a system of thought. It's not uh, perfecting your individual morality. Well, then what is it? Well, it's an experience. It's going to the Grand Canyon. It's hiking through that beautiful scenery in the Rocky Mountains. It's actually knowing the person that you've heard about or read about. It's an experience of God's love. Now, I've shared with you that this happened to me when I was 17 years old. I had uh, smaller experiences of God's love throughout my childhood, but I had one where I felt almost invaded in a good sense of the word, maybe rescued would be a better word, by the love of God. I didn't really ask for it that I know of. Maybe my heart was asking for it, but I, 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 was, I was saturated for a moment in the love of God, and I knew it came through Jesus the Christ. And it, it turned my life. Uh, it didn't make my life perfect. And it didn't make my morality perfect or my belief system perfect or any of those things I just said it isn't about. But it changed me, or began to change me, is more accurate, from the inside out into a fully uh, growing experience of the love of God, where, where I felt fully accepted. See, this is what I want. Jesus felt fully accepted by the Father. We're meant to feel fully accepted by the Abba of Jesus. We're meant to feel fully forgiven. Jesus didn't need to feel fully forgiven. We do. And Jesus told us, my Abba forgives you, therefore you're supposed to forgive others. Our forgiveness of others is based on our fully accepting our own forgiveness. And it's leaning into the fact that, as hard as it is to believe, God actually enjoys you. He's not just putting up with you. You're not just a project, you know? It's like my, my new grandson that I've talked about. I, I, I just fully enjoy him. I, I've got, if I had my iPhone here and open it up, you'd see his picture with his beautiful blue eyes showing. He doesn't have to do anything to bring me joy. I just look at him and I feel joy. That's the way God feel, felt about Jesus. The Father felt about Jesus. And that's the way the Abba of Jesus feels about you. And so we need to accept our own acceptance. You know, accept the fact that we're accepted. You know, sometimes my wife will give me a compliment and, uh, and I'll say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And she'll say, no, you didn't receive it. What? Yeah, I just told you, you know, you've been a really good husband or you did a really great job on this or that. And, and, and she was right. I just pushed right past my own acceptance. She's telling me how acceptable I am. And I didn't take the time to, to drink it in. And that can be true with God that... We need to accept our own acceptance. We need to receive our own forgiveness. It's one thing for God to forgive us through Christ. It's another thing for you to take that present that's so beautifully wrapped and open it up and receive it and, and, and live in your own forgiveness. And then, just like God enjoys us, it's up to us to learn to enjoy God. One of the great... Um, creeds uh, in, in the Christian tradition says uh, the chief aim of humankind is to love God and enjoy God forever. That's such a great statement. You see, you, you, you don't enjoy a system of thought. You don't enjoy perfecting your own individual morality. You enjoy a being, an, another being that you're connected with, and you find joy in that person, in, the, in this case, the person of God. 
Now, we've just scratched the surface on the, on, on the actual teachings of Jesus and the beliefs of Jesus. Let me just tell you a few of them we haven't mentioned. Whet your appetite for another series, you know, maybe down the road. We haven't talked about Jesus' view on the use of money. We have talked about how we're not supposed to store it up and pile it up and trust in it, but we've, we haven't talked about what we are supposed to do with it. Jesus had an amazing idea about what, how we should think about using our money. We haven't looked into what Jesus taught on prayer. A pretty obvious one, right? He, he gave us the Lord's Prayer, he prayed himself, and he taught some things, some parables about prayer. We haven't looked at those yet. We really didn't do much looking at the concept of forgiveness. Uh, when do you forgive people? How do you forgive people? How does it work within your own heart? Uh, or how about deservability? Uh, I'm not even sure that's a word, but it's the one that came to me. We, we all want to deserve the love of God. What did Jesus say about how, uh, how, how that works, how that functions? We didn't look at what it takes to make peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, what does it take to make peace? We didn't look at Jesus' thoughts on busyness. Now, that's one our culture could really use some thinking about. We're all running around like chickens with our heads cut off and can't figure out why we don't have peace in our hearts. Busyness, he had a great thought, many great thoughts on that. We, we really didn't look very deeply into what Jesus thought about how we should deal with others. We looked at a couple things. But uh, how would we deal with somebody in overt sin, doing something very destructive? How would we deal with people who are being destructive directly toward us? How would we deal with betrayal? How would we deal with ignorant wounding? Somebody who hurts you but didn't mean to. They didn't, they didn't understand what they were doing. We didn't look into how Jesus, what he taught about fear. I mean, so many people, especially during this pandemic, have have been living with fear or anxiety. Jesus actually talks about anxiety as well. We didn't look into what Jesus taught about leadership or what Jesus taught about attachments or what Jesus taught about true generosity or compassion. He had very specific thoughts about all of those that welled up from inside his own experience of his Father in heaven and spilled out all over the universe in his loving actions and treatment of others. Now in my own journey, as I said, I, I, I had this overwhelming experience of being loved by God at a very young age. And that set me on a journey, my own journey, where it kind of became a long road to learning a lot of stuff about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Bible and church history and theology and psychology and all kinds of things that took me into the, what we call the professional ministry, a life of activism, a life of trying to help others and teach and preach and, and, and heal in certain ways. And, and during that time, I added and added and added and added things about Jesus, but along the path, my own inner experience of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit and of the Father really became a bit truncated, uh, overweighted with all the things I'd learned and all the things I was doing and all the busyness I was doing for God. And there came a point in my later life when I just decided I have to put the brakes on here and rethink this. And that's when I took six weeks and, and as you've heard, uh, hiked across northern Spain. But it was a pilgrimage of the heart for me. It was a pilgrimage of walking, to be sure. But that, that was really the pretext for an inner pilgrimage of saying, who, who am I now? And, and, and what am I doing with my life? And I decided to enter into a quieter interior space with God. I, as I look back, I think, even Jesus in his young years, he died at age 33, would often take time alone out in the wilderness to just be with his father, to be in the presence. I mean, he was always in the presence, but to become more fully available to that presence. And so I did that, and during that time, there were some serious things I needed to let go of. Not necessarily bad things, though. There were some of those. 
but there were some grudges, there was some lack of forgiveness, there were fears, there were anxieties, there was distractions, there were all kinds of things that became clear to me that though I had built them all up over these years, many of them good things, by the way, I, they were, they were uh, too central in my spiritual life. And I needed to let go. I needed to, in fact, dismantle some of my systems of thought, my systems of action. It, it, it was a major course correction. Uh, that's actually kind of an understatement. But I did find that at the end of that six weeks and on into the years that followed, I believed a lot less things or a lot fewer things. But I believed the things I believed more fully. And I found a tremendous freedom in that to pare it down, to simplify it down to the essence which is the experience of being fully accepted by God, allowing that to transform me little by little by little, dying to that kind of limited, false, fragmented self that all of us create as kind of our persona, dying to that, letting it just kind of fall apart in the presence of love, and building on the true self, which as we looked at, is hidden with Christ in God, your true self, not this phony version that, that you've sold to others and probably even sold to yourself and maybe don't even know it's phony. But that needs to come apart stitch by stitch so that the freedom of who you are can, can come out. Now, in this process, last week I told you I wanted to talk about some practices that might help you and last week I, I shared, it, it takes a decision at some level. Uh, Dallas Willard, one of my favorite authors, a late friend of mine, passed away a number of years ago. He used to say, you, you don't drift into discipleship. Discipleship is a journey with Jesus Christ. You're his disciple, you're his students. And Dallas Willard said, you don't drift into that. You decide. You answer a call. There's something in you that wants it, and you make a choice. And so, you know, I ask you, after you've been following this whole series, do you actually want to walk with Jesus? Not just hear about his teachings, not just listen to these talks, but actually experience the love and the forgiveness and the acceptability that he talked about and, and offered. And I said last week, it takes time. Both the process of time, this doesn't happen instantly, and dedicated time. It, it, you make the time to go deeper. And it'll take new practices, we talked about last week, new behaviors, which are meant to become habits, which are meant to become an authentic way of living. C.S. Lewis, in, in uh, the beginning parts of his book, Mere Christianity, uh, in one part says something along the lines of, you know, it, it's not like having you become a, a, a better tennis player. Like, if you're a bad tennis player, you can still hit some good shots once in a while. Well, if you're kind of a lackadaisical believer in Jesus, you're still going to hit some good shots once in a while. You know, you'll give somebody some love when they don't seem to deserve it. But, but that's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for somebody who can make a good shot once in a while. We're looking for somebody you can depend on to make good shots most of the time that they'll do the loving thing most of the time, that they'll do the forgiving thing most of the time, that they'll do the welcoming thing most of the time. And in fact, we're not even just looking for that, Lewis says. We're looking for a, a kind of tone to the person, he says, that they, there's something you feel when you're in a person like that's presence. And it's something of the, the holy. It's something of the divine. So how do we do that? What are some of these practices well, I'm going to talk about two big ones and a couple ones that fit under it here in the next few minutes. I think if you were to do one thing, if you had the choice to do one thing that would take you deeper, it would be to reflect on your own life very deeply and reflect on the life of Jesus very deeply. In the opening chapter of Thomas Akempis' great classic work, The Imitation of Christ, he says this, let us make the life of Jesus Christ our first consideration. 
Let us make the life of Jesus Christ our first consideration. I would start there. And then make your own life a matter of deep reflection as well. So that, so that you're actually dealing with who you are. So that you're surrendering who you really are to God. Not who you pretend to be even to yourself. Those two acts and practices reflect deeply on the life of Jesus. Reflect deeply on your own life. You might take a journal out, go buy a journal, and just go through your own life and, and write your story. It could just be bullet points, or you could be handwritten, however you want to do it, and think and reflect in a way that you actually confront the good, the medium, and the not so good in your own life. And you take an honest look at it and bring it to God. Those are the two big avenues, reflection on God and Jesus, reflection on your own life. And obviously the goal is to see them come more like this. Now, the reflection on your own life might take some professional help. You might need a therapist or a spiritual director. Sometimes if we've had trauma in our, in our uh, life, to reflect on it can take us into a, a dark space that's not helpful. Then find somebody to help you. There are healers out there, psychologists, uh, marriage and family counselors, pastors, uh, spiritual directors. Get help. You know, get, get help with the process if you need it. Or a good friend. Maybe if it's not, the need isn't there for uh, the professional help, maybe just having a friend that you share this with, that you trust, that you know won't judge. So those are two of the big ones. But then here are some of the smaller, though very profound, practices you could try. Get a pencil out and jot these down. First one is silence. I don't mean to be crass here, but it really does mean just shut up. Just shut up and shut some things out. Shut some things up, like what you want to tell everybody or you want to tell yourself, and shut some things out, all the voices that are coming to you from the culture, from your past, from a million different sources. Just be silent for a while. And by the way, you can practice silence in a noisy place. Uh, you could be in the middle of a stadium filled with people and practice silence yourself. It, it, it takes a lot of work because we're afraid of silence. We tend to do all kinds of things to avoid it. That's why, that's why when you go to the mall or anywhere else, they've always got music going, or they've always got TV screens. We hate the idea of being alone with ourselves. It brings fear, and it's not meant to. It should bring joy. Second one, solitude. Solitude means you actually are away from all the distractions, as best you can be. You go to a monastery, or you camp out, or you go sit by a lake. You, you're, you're alone. It's what Jesus did when he got up early in the morning and he went off before dawn just to be with his father, uh, to experience his father without all the distractions. Solitude. Uh, try it in short amounts in the beginning because it's hard. As you begin to love it, you'll find you want to spend a lot more time because you're not actually alone. You're actually opening your spirit to the spirit of God without the distractions. Third, I won't go into much detail because I talked about it last week, and that's deep reading, both of the scriptures and of other great works on the spiritual life. And I mentioned the practice of the presence of God as a great place to start uh, by Brother Lawrence, a small book that would be tremendous. There are other authors you might think about following. Andre Nowen as one that uh, has touched me, Thomas Akempis, Thomas Kelly, an American uh, believer and follower of Jesus, St. Teresa of Avila, the interior castle. There's so many, so many. Brennan Manning, some of his uh, works before he passed away. Do some deep reading. When you do that reflection on your own life, you're going to come up with some stuff that's not so good. And so then it takes a discipline of repentance. That means you're going to look at it for what it is and you're going to choose to turn away from whatever behavior or attitude was taking you into darker places rather than places of love. And, and, and it will normally lead you to desire to make amends with people you might have hurt through those actions. 
I, I love what the 12 steps say, make amends unless to do so would create further harm. You don't want to go say you're far, sorry for something to somebody if that's going to cause them more harm. If it's going to cause them more harm, don't do it. Just make yourself right with God. But there's amendment, change in our lives. And then there's self-forgiveness. To forgive yourself uh, for not being the person you wished you'd been. In fact, there's this great uh, quote by a different Teresa, <laughs> Teresa of Lesso, or Therese de Lesso, and she said something like this. She said, dealing with the burden of being disappointing to ourselves is a beautiful place for Jesus to dwell. Bearing the burden of being disappointed with ourselves is a beautiful place for Jesus to dwell. You think she's going to say, dealing with the burden of being disappointed to ourselves is really difficult, which it is. But she says it's also beautiful because you're actually being honest. And right in your own brokenness is a place Jesus, the Spirit, the Father, long to show up and tell you, you are acceptable. You are acceptable. You are my beloved child. Then there's meditation. You take a verse from scripture that touches your heart and you meditate on it. You pray, you get quiet, you listen to it, you maybe even memorize it. You write and you journal about it. You, you have a conversation with it. Uh, it might be like when Jesus said to the fishermen, uh, throw your nets over into the deep for a catch, a real catch. And you read that and you go, that's what I need to do. I need, I need to throw the net of my life into the deep water of God's love for a real catch. And you could reflect on that and pray and allow God to speak to you. That's called meditation in the, in the Christian tradition. Then there's contemplation. And contemplation is when you don't have a thing that you're thinking about, a thought, a reading, a scripture. It's where you just seek to put yourself uh, fully open into the presence of God. You, you don't put yourself in the presence of God. You are in the presence of God. You just don't realize it. So your contemplation is when you find practices that help still your mind and soul, calm them down so that you actually simply sit or walk or stand in the presence of God. There's another one called examines where you just simply two, three times a day or maybe only once, you just scan your day, not with judgment, but with honesty to see where was I walking in the spirit of love and where was I not? And when you find a place where you're not, you surrender it to God. You ask for forgiveness. If there's a need to make amends to somebody, you choose to do that the next day. Those are called examines. Another one is retreat. I, I, Linda and I have done this so many times. It's so great just to go on a spiritual retreat. Go to a Christian conference center like Mount Hermon or go, or go on a contemplative retreat where there's a teacher teaching about the spiritual life. Take three days off, one day off, and immerse yourself in spiritual practices. I mentioned journal. That's another practice you could do. Just get a journal and start writing once a day or once a week your thoughts about the Lord, your thoughts about your own life. Or write uh, spontaneously and don't even try to edit or make it sound good. This isn't for anybody else. It's not going to be published. <laughs> you know, you don't have to worry about other people reading. It's for you and God. Just writing out your worries, your anxieties. You know, Paul says, tell God every detail of your needs in earnest and thankful prayer. And the peace of God will protect your hearts, guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Tell him every detail of your needs. That's journaling. And the last one I'll mention is spiritual direction. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's something that isn't as familiar in my own personal tradition in the Presbyterian Church, although it's becoming more. But it's where it's not therapy, it's not a counselor, it's where somebody is trained to help you find what God is doing in your life. They're, they're not there to heal you, they're not there to fix you, they're there to help you listen to the inner voice of God in your own life. Those are spiritual directors. And there, there are organizations that can connect you to a spiritual director in your area if that's something that you think would be helpful. So, the beliefs of Jesus. We come to Jesus to learn from Jesus 
how to believe like Jesus and therefore how to live our lives the way Jesus would live our lives if he had our lives to live. And, and he's meant to have our lives to live. We come to him to learn from him how to be like him. And it's a process and a journey of grace. So take the first step or the 20th step wherever you are right now. You might be sitting there watching this uh, on your video screen or on your television or listening to it in, in your car. I don't know. But maybe this is your moment to surrender more of yourself, as best you know yourself, to more of who you hope God is. You surrender your heart, your life, your problems, your situations, your joys, your sorrow, who you are, you, you hand them over. Maybe this is a moment for you to do that. It might be the first time you've done it, like I did at 17 years old or 16 where somehow I just felt this pull, this draw, and, and I, I gave into it, and it's the best thing I've ever done. This might be your moment to do that, or this might be your moment to make a decision. I don't want to just believe things about Jesus. I don't just want to believe in Jesus. I want to walk like Jesus. I want to believe what he believed. I want to live from the same source he lived from. In my own broken way, in my own partial way, I want to not just look at the map, but hike in the country. You know, I, I, I don't want to just see pictures of the Grand Canyon. I want to, I want to lean over the rim. I, I don't want to just read a biography about this person. I want to meet them and fall in love with them. And in this case, the person is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I hope you've enjoyed the series, but actually more importantly than that, I hope you make a decision, the most appropriate decision for you at this time in your life, whatever that may be, to go deeper in so that you can say, like Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I long to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by trust in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amazing grace How sweet that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but
the sound that saved a rest like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now But now I see. Kathleen, thanks as always for that music. Uh, your music touches my hearts and the hearts of so many people. I want to share, especially with those of you uh, who are part of our local. Uh, family of faith, a couple really encouraging things. Um, the first is that uh, our associate pastor, David Muscofian Caker, uh, is going to be taking on more leadership role in our church. Our session, which is the, what we call our leadership team, have decided to uh, increase his time to half time and uh, he will be taking on leadership roles that, in, in all honesty, will take some things off my shoulders and my uh, plate uh, so that I can concentrate a little bit more on, on the things that uh, I really love at this season of my life to bring as contributions, teaching and prayer primarily. And, and David is so gifted at this, so gifted at pastoral care, which simply means he'll show up uh, when you have a need and, and be there as a tremendously caring presence. He'll also be taking on, on some, uh, some of the role of supervising our staff and some of our operations along with the rest of our team, but he'll be, he'll be heading that up. So he'll be preaching a little bit more uh, in this year ahead, and this all starts on July 1st. And I'm personally very grateful. David and I have been working together for, I don't know, five or six years, and it, it's just been a delight. Our friendship has grown, and, and uh, my sense of who he is and watching the love that he has for people, uh, he's a true pastor. And I'm just glad that uh, we're going to get a little more time uh, to enjoy his gifts. Second, um, I want you to know that you know we're, we're hoping to get back into our church building maybe sooner than we thought originally, and I want to let you know what you can look forward to seeing when we do. We don't know exactly when it's going to be, uh, but we, we hope it's going to be earlier than we thought it would have been. You know, Maybe we'll be back in by October, September, or who knows, maybe even earlier. But we'll, we'll be in as soon as it's safe to do so. But I want you to know, for those of you who love this building, uh, we have replaced the floor. It looks lovely. It's a European oak. We had to do it because the other floor was uh, over 100 years old and was just uh, deteriorating and, and not safe. And uh, the building team with George Frampton's leadership on the floors uh, just done a tremendous job. You're going to love it. And then uh, we just had a, a, a donation from an anonymous donor, and we, are, uh, we found out when we took the pews out that they weren't as <laughs> solid as we thought they were. They are also quite old and, frankly, weren't that well built in the first place. And so we've had a donation that's allowed our session to purchase uh, new pews. They'll be pews. They're, they're beautiful. They're, they're also oak, uh, Oregon oak in this case. Um, and they will just look lovely. I think it, it won't feel much different than when you came in before. It'll still be that sacred space, um, uh, but they will last for another 100 years, and uh, we hope to have those uh, as soon as possible. I'm, I'm hoping we have them by August. We're not sure. It depends on their custom-made, handmade here in the United States in Idaho, which is very encouraging by a family-owned business that's been doing this for 70 years. Just, uh, uh, we were very impressed with the product. So at any rate, you're gonna come back in. There's no, no other changes. You're, you're the pulpit's here. The, everything you used to seeing will be here. And uh, we are so looking forward to having real people right here in, in this building where I'm sitting, 
right now with our stained glass windows that we all love. So we'll welcome you back at that time, and uh, believe me, it'll be as soon as possible.